I'm Arnie Eisen, Chancellor of JTS, and I want to welcome all of you here this evening. Thank you. Um, especially for those of you who are here for the first time. I'm happy, honored, delighted beyond words to welcome the panelists who are with me on the stage this evening, Dr. Susanna Heschel and Dr. Mel Skolt. And their topic will be Abraham Joshua Heschel and Mordechai M. Kaplan, cross-sections and intersections. So please, let's welcome our two distinguished guests. <laughs> Needless to say, there are a few announcements before we begin. The first of which is that had I not known I was supposed to announce this, I would, have, I would not have turned off my cell phone 30 seconds ago. So please take this moment to turn off all your cell phones. Second announcement is I'm delighted to say that following the talk, our two distinguished speakers will be available to sign books, which will be for sale in the lobby, both books they have written and books by Heschel and Kaplan, which will also be available for purchase in the lobby. Let me say a few words before the introductions. The excitement about the talk tonight, capacity room despite the thunderstorm that's going on outside, is testimony to how much Heschel and Kaplan continue to mean to so many of us in this room, to the Jewish community, and to our society as a whole. I only had the privilege of meeting each of them once, encounters which shaped me forever after. I know that there are people in this room who knew one or both of them very well, studied with them, argued with them. I I can just say for myself that I would have loved to be a fly on the wall of JTS when the two of them were walking down the hallways together about 50 years ago. I would love to know what they were saying, whether they said the same things in person that they wrote in their books. I'd love to know if they said the same things to one another that they say to me and to one another in my head as I talk to them and hear them talk to each other almost on a weekly basis. There are lots of lessons that we carry away from Mordechai Kaplan and Abraham Joshua Heschel, from their teachings, from their lives, from their personae, from their photographs, and especially, of course, that iconic photograph of King and Heschel in Alabama that hangs outside my office, which I turn to every day for inspiration. And so I'd like to begin this evening by reminding us all of just one such lesson, a lesson from them that if memory serves, and it may be mythic, but I think it's historical, that I was given as a teenager at Congregation Emmanuel in Philadelphia when our assistant rabbi took a bunch of us outside of services to teach us contemporary Jewish thinkers. And at that time, I received and read this dog-eared copy, which I still use, of Judaism as a Civilization, and this even more dog-eared copy of God to Search a Man by Abraham Joshua Heschel. And when I heard Heschel say, not just say, but I thought say to me, on the very first page of God in Search of Man, that religion had declined because it became irrelevant, dull, oppressive, and insipid. I knew he was speaking to me. When he said, when faith is completely replaced by creed, Worship by discipline, love by habit. When the, cri the crisis of today is ignored because of the splendor of the past, when faith becomes an heirloom rather than a living fountain, when religion speaks only in the name of authority rather than with the voice of compassion, its message becomes meaningless. And I took that as a challenge. I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room who did so. I took that as a challenge to say to me, if Judaism as you experience it is irrelevant, dull, oppressive, and insipid, you have been denied Judaism as it is, was, and should be. And more than that, you have a task to do. You are needed. And to say to a teenager that you are needed as part of this message of the book that God is in search of man and life is serious and the world is serious and your work is needed to help save this world and to help save your own tradition that was a very powerful message to get at the age of 15 or 16, or to get at the age of 50 or 60 or 70. And you know something? Kaplan gives almost the very same message. In this case, it's the very last paragraph of Judaism as a Civilization, when he says, in sum, those who look to Judaism in its present state to provide them with ready-made scheme of salvation in this world or in the next, are bound to be disappointed 
the Jew will have to save Judaism before Judaism will be in a position to save the Jew. A program of work is needed. Such a program calls for a degree of honesty that abhors all forms of self-delusion, for a temper that reaches out to new consummations, for the type of courage that is not deterred by uncharted regions. Those words are applicable as much today as they were when Kaplan wrote them in the early 1930s. We all have work to do. Judaism needs partners. God needs partners. It's a summons that many of us are trying to heed. And I think that's what brings many of us together this evening. I want to thank you all for being here, and I want to thank the Rappaport family for giving us this annual lecture, originally endowed in 1982 by Mrs. Selma Rappaport, a past president of the Women's League for Conservative Judaism and the longtime member of the JTS board in memory of her husband, Henry Ann Rappaport. Henry was a distinguished attorney, a committed Jew, who served as president of Temple Israel Center in White Plains and later as president of the United Synagogue, an active member of the JTS board, and a generous benefactor of JTS's scholarly programs. I'm pleased to recognize the presence of the family here with us this evening, Michael Rappaport together with his wife Joanne and David together with his wife Deborah, along with other members of the Rappaport family joining us. We thank the Rappaport family for their generosity and you can see by the attendance how much this evening means. I know Michael would want all of us to remember that we're not just here to celebrate the past, we're here to make that past live just as vibrantly in the present. We're here to make conservative Judaism and Judaism in general a force for good in this world. Um, there are many other people I'd like to welcome. I'm going to single out three for special notice and for everybody else, please forgive me. First, I want to welcome Anne Eisenstein, who is joining us together. Mrs. Eisen Ms. Eisenstein is Mordechai Kaplan's granddaughter. And Anne, are, where are you? So we can acknowledge you. I want to say thank you, Anne, for being here. There she is. It's a treat. Talk about legacies continuing. And I mentioned to Anne that her, fire, her father, Ira, was always really warm and receptive to me as a struggling young professor of Jewish studies trying to understand Mordechai M. Kaplan. I am happy to welcome my friend David Ellenson, the president of Hebrew Union College, who is here with us this evening. David, are you here? There you are. And also, finally, in the front row, I want to send, extend a special warm welcome to Dr. Cornell West, a very prominent scholar of religion. I have him down here as a scholar and philosopher, but I want to say he's a man that is proud to call himself also a theologian, which is a craft that many of us think needs a lot of work these days. And I'm happy to see that Cornell is my ally in trying to revive the subject of theology. Cornell has joined our neighbor across the street, Union Theological Seminary. He's teaching a course on Abraham Joshua Heschel at Union this semester, and is at work on a book about Rabbi Heschel. Welcome to J JTS Cornell, and I hope it won't be your last visit across the street. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers this evening. Dr. Mel Skull, Professor Emeritus of Judaic Studies at Brooklyn College, City University of New York, has also served as adjunct professor of philosophy at JTS. Mel is, as many of you know, the preeminent biographer of Mordechai Kaplan. He has published several volumes of Kaplan's work and of his diaries, which are an incredible source for those of us who are trying to understand the man and his legacy. Mel's works include Dynamic Judaism, The Essential Writings of Mordechai Kaplan, Judaism Faces the 20th Century, a Biography of Mordechai Kaplan, and others. Mel earned his bachelor's degrees from JTS and from New York University, master's degree from Harvard, and a doctorate in Judaic studies from Brandeis University. Sitting on Mel's left, Dr. Susanna Heschel is the Eli Black Professor of Jewish Studies at Dartmouth College serves on the faculty in the Jewish Studies program, the Department of Religion, and the Women and Gender Studies program. My hesitation a minute ago, Susanna, was I wanted to say, does the title Daughter of Abraham Joshua Heschel come before your academic achievements or should it come afterwards? <laughs> so I decided to say the academic achievements and then add this minor little bit of acquaintanceship 
daughter of Abraham Joshua Heschel. Her research and teaching focus on Jewish-Christian relations in Germany during the 19th and 20th centuries, the history of biblical scholarship, and the history of anti-Semitism. Professor Heschel has numerous publications that include Abraham Geiger and the Jewish Jesus, which won a National Jewish Book Award. She's also edited and co-edited several books, including Heschel's collections of moral grandeur and spiritual audacity, essays of Abraham Joshua Heschel. Dr. Heschel earned her bachelor's degree from Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, a master's from Harvard Divinity School, and her doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania. The order of the evening is going to work as follows. I am now going to invite Mel Skull to the podium to begin tonight's program, and Mel has some introductory observations and a special treat in store for all of us, which you'll hear in a moment. He is going to be followed by Dr. Heschel's remarks, and Dr. Skolt will then return to the podium to speak further, and then we'll have a little dialogue between the two of them, and the floor will be open to questions from all of you. It's my honor now to welcome Professor Mel Skolt. Thank you very much, Arnie, for your very gracious introduction. I want to uh, recognize a number of people. Uh, Tom Cageton, Tom, where are you? Who is from the, in the back, from the Public Affairs Department of the seminary and responsible very much for the crowd that's here. Um, I want to recognize Dan Cederbaum. Dan, where are you? Um, Dan Cederbaum is here from Evanston, Illinois. He is the executive director of our recently formed Kaplan Center for Jewish Peoplehood. Um, we are going to put up a website in the near future. We hope to have a conference in Washington in 2014 and a conference in Israel in the summer of that year. Uh, if you're interested in our center, um, please write me at mail at kaplancenter.org and we'll put you on our mailing list. Is Neil Gilman here? Is Neil Gilman here? I want to recognize and thank Neil. He's not here. Um, I, I need to express my deepest gratitude to him because he is very largely responsible for my book on Mordechai Kaplan that's due to come out from Indiana University Press in November. Um, Arnie mentioned the course that I taught here in Kaplan. Uh, it was Neil's, with Neil's help, uh, that I taught that course, and uh, the course forced me to organize the mountain of material that I have on Mordechai Kaplan, forced me to structure it, and that structure became the structure for the book. So I can't express myself enough in gratitude towards uh, Neil Gilman. Um, now, I want to start the program um, by offering you uh, words from uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel and Mordechai Kaplan, except we're going to hear from them. I brought a clip with me, um, which has three parts. Uh, the first two parts are um, Dr. Heschel, and it is from the 90th uh, birthday celebration of Mordechai Kaplan in 1971, and Heschel, in the first part of the clip is thinking of a title for his speech, and he shares that with the audience. Um, in the second part of the clip, uh, Heschel mentions an essay that he wrote when he first came to the United States, which was noticed by Kaplan, and which forms a major part of my presentation, um, and he mentions Kaplan's reaction to that. The third uh, part of the clip is um, Mordechai Kaplan speaking at Park Avenue Synagogue um, on the 10th anniversary of the Yort site of the uh, death of Milton Steinberg. Milton Steinberg was a great conservative rabbi. Many of you know him from his novel As a Driven Leaf or from Basic Judaism. And Kaplan speaking um, at that occasion, um, Milton Steinberg was one of Kaplan's most devoted disciples. Um, and so uh, Kaplan is expressing his views and he's talking about what the belief in God should mean to us. 
Now, I'm told that the audiovisual department is going to play the clip, and all I have to say is, play the clip. I decided perhaps to speak to Professor Kaplan as civilization. <laughs> because he's a, he is a, happening to be a younger colleague of his on, this, on the faculty of the Jewish Theological Seminary. He's one of the most civilized human beings I've ever met. He's so wonderful. So Professor Kaplan of Civilization wouldn't be a bad title. He exemplifies civilization. <laughs> of this man, that longing, that waiting. I can never forget a very simple fact, by the way. My first essay published in English when I came to America, a year after I arrived here, was an essay about called An Analysis of Piety, published in a journal, Review of Religion. The men who, be, who became uh, rather enthusiastic about this essay was my first publication in English, and demanded of his students passionately that they should all read it, was Professor Kaplan. Now, what was this a sign of? A sign of tremendous passion for Judaism. The, what you can really criticize him for is he's not detached. As Gaita Milev Marang, you understand Yiddish? Christianism has the emotional appeal in that it tries to have us Jews recover the lost sense of sacredness, the feeling of holiness. Holy is a lost word in our vocabulary. By making us aware of what God should mean to us in terms not of vicarious experience, the experience of our ancestors, of our parents or grandparents, that it should mean to us in terms not of metaphysical speculation, nor of blind leaps of faith, but in terms of moral and ethical experience, which is highly charged with emotion, that is the source of the emotional appeal in the Reconstructionist ideology. In the first place, God should mean to us the loyalty and love for the social body, society, or people we belong to. It is not the question of what God is, but what should God mean in terms of experience of feeling and the answer is in terms of feeling it should mean love and loyalty for our Jewish people loyalty and love for our Jewish people can help to make us fully human in the best sense of that term and for that reason such emotion and such love is divine is an experience of divinity Secondly, God should mean to us the sense of moral responsibility. Its emotional value derives from the feeling of human dignity implied in being treated as a person. The feeling of responsibility is, a, is a, an experience of holiness because when we are made to feel that we are responsible, we are credited with the dignity of being human with the freedom and the right to choose among alternatives that which makes life worthwhile. It is thus a manifestation of divinity in human life. Thirdly, God should mean to us, and this is what our ideology emphasizes, never mind the question of ultimate reality of God. What should God mean to us in our experience, namely the normal want to be whole and integrated mentally and morally with ourselves and our fellow men. Integrity is thus a manifestation of divinity. Okay, I have a philosophy of life which I call Dayenu, that we should be satisfied. I feel that we can end the program right here and, <laughs> and that would be enough. So I want to open with a prayer. Kaplan taught at the Jewish Theological Seminary for over 50 years. He was the longest uh, lived member of the faculty. 
and he was the only member of the faculty that opened his classes with a prayer. And the prayer changed from time to time. Sometimes it was from the Shachrit service in the morning, Ba'arevna Adonai Eloheinu et Divrei Torat Chabafinu. You can finish it, those of you who daven in the morning. Let the words of Torah, O Lord our God, be sweet in our mouths. This is the way he opened his classes. He sometimes opened his classes with what is sometimes referred to as the philosopher's prayer. From the cowardice that shrinks from new truth, from the laziness that is content with half-truths, from the arrogance that thinks it knows all truth, O God of truth, deliver us. I'm very much indebted to my collaborator and friend and colleague, uh, Emmanuel Goldsmith, for uh, giving me uh, these prayers. Buber, Martin Buber famously stated that all real living was meeting or encounter. I want to begin with an encounter between Abraham Joshua Heschel and Mordechai Kaplan here at the seminary. Now, we didn't plan this, that Arnie said he wanted to be a fly on the wall, but I was the fly on the wall, or Kaplan was the fly on the wall, somebody was on the wall, and this is the record of a, of a conversation between Kaplan and Heschel in 1952. They had socialized the night before, the Kaplans were at the Heschels, and Mordechai Kaplan was unhappy that they didn't have an opportunity to speak seriously, and so he sees Heschel in the hall, and he says the following. This is his record in his diary. Both of us wanted to discuss matters pertaining to the disparities in our philosophies of life and Judaism. The upshot of our differences is this. He seems to accept the conclusions of historical research and is on the whole no more and no less mystically inclined than I am. Very interesting point. Whereas I believe in stressing freedom and release from whatever is archaic and outworn, as well as in affirming what is true and acceptable, he contends that we should confine ourselves to the affirmations. He maintains that my disciples, my disciples flaunt my negatives. I'm afraid I've sometimes been guilty of that, and we're going to try to stick tonight with the affirmations. Kaplan continues, when he, meaning Heschel, asked me to give him my impression of his work, I told him that I thought it was a mistake to seek God through the ineffable. If the belief in God was to make a difference in our lives, he has to be sought in and identified with experience. He said that he hoped to do that in a forthcoming volume. It's a very, very interesting conversation. There is something here of the older and the younger. Heschel seems to want to please Kaplan. It's well to remember that Kaplan was 26 years older than Heschel. Kaplan had been on the American Jewish scene for a very long time. He had published. He was very, very well known. Heschel was still young at this point, and um, not, he was just publishing his first work, uh, first work of theology, Man is Not Alone, hence the conversation. I want to affirm the commonalities between them, and so I want to give you some selections from my file in my computer called Kaplan as Heschel, <laughs> or, or Mordecai the Pious. Kaplan writes in 1943, I have been studying Kaplan for 40 years. 40 years. He is a very, very complex person. And I always find surprising things. Now listen, piety, this is Kaplan talking. Piety is an experience which means awareness of a transcendent power in the cosmos. A universal consciousness or spirit that seeks to direct humanity 
into the path of salvation. That's Mordecai Kaplan in 1943. Another selection from that file has to do with religion. It, I would call it in Buber's terms, the translation religion and religiosity or religion and piety. And Kaplan comes down very, very strongly on the side of piety, as you'll see here. Religion is a matter of belonging. Piety is a matter of believing. Religion is prose. Piety is poetry. God in religion is what the flower is to the botanist. God in piety is what the flower is to the poet. God in religion is the power that makes for salvation. God in piety is any being from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to any being whose presence was or is experienced with what Otto calls the overwhelming sense of the numinous. Now, who wrote that? Who wrote that? I mean, it sounds like Heschel. He seems to be putting down religion in the service of piety. So Kaplan's spirituality is a very complex spirituality, and we ought to remember that he comes from a very traditional home. He was a graduate of the seminary. He was a conservative rabbi. And for all his heresy, he struggled with the same problems that other conservative rabbis had of the time. His spirituality is very idiosyncratic, and I hope to give you a sense of that tonight. Heschel begins his odyssey in the United States, in Cincinnati. He was rescued by the reform movement, and he came there in the early 1940s. Such was Heschel's linguistic genius. He had spent nine months in England that he was able to write an article that he mentions in the clip very soon after he arrived. It was 1942. Kaplan saw the article, and Kaplan liked it very, very much. Heschel was concerned in that article, which is in Suzanne's collection, an analysis of piety. Heschel was concerned with the objectivity of piety, the objectivity, whether it was something psychological or whether it was something that existed apart from the individuals. And Kaplan had been thinking about exactly that issue, he writes in the journal. And so Kaplan took the essay and he shares it with his rabbinical students. And he says, this is the way to reconstruct traditional Judaism. Heschel is the way to reconstruct traditional Judaism. So you might say that Heschel becomes part of Kaplan's program of reconstruction. <laughs> I don't want to be imperialistic here, but you know. <laughs> more than that, more than that, Kaplan said to Louis Finkelstein in the early 20s, chancellor of the seminary, what you need to do in order to create new liturgy, I'm not sure that Finkelstein was interested in creating new liturgy, but he told him you have to take an inspirational essay and turn it into a poem. Those of you who write well, I suggest that as an exercise. It's very, very, very difficult. <laughs> and Kaplan does it. Kaplan created this poem and he inserted it in his prayer book, in his prayer book that was published in 1945. So Kaplan was telling us that we should pray from Heschel. We should pray from Heschel. And this is not just a scissors and paste kind of thing. Um, it's a transformation. I want to remind you, however, that this is the language of Heschel. The poem is Kaplan, but the language is Heschel. It's called The Pious Man, and it's in the Kaplan prayer book. What is piety? Is it the abandonment of the world? Is it scrupulous performance of rites or fanatic zeal? Let us observe the pious man and probe into his soul. We shall discover in it that which transcends man, that which surmounts the visible and available, steadily preventing him from immersing himself in sensation or ambition, from yielding to passion or slaving for a career. For him, life takes place amid horizons beyond the span of years. He senses the significant in small things. He is alive to the sublime in common acts and simple thoughts. This is not the whole poem, but later on, piety is his entire life. Faith precedes piety. Piety is faith's achievement. 
Faith desires to meet God. Piety to abide by him. Faith strives to know his will. Piety to do it. Faith yearns to hear his voice. Piety to respond to it. I'm very, very moved by that poem, of course. And what I think we have here is an insight, if I may, into Kaplan's subconscious. Emerson says that other men are lenses through which we read our own mind. And I think that's what's happening here. I discovered the Kaplan Heschel poem um, about 15 years ago. And alongside it, I discovered a poem based on an essay by Ralph Waldo Emerson, the Divinity School Address of 1838. And Kaplan was telling me that I ought to pray from Emerson. So I started to read Emerson. And I got knee deep and I couldn't get out. I was in Emerson uh, criticism and Emerson biography for 15 years. And the point is that I had a very, very uh, deep emotional spiritual experience. Because in the 1940s, in the 1930s and 40s, before the prayer book came out, Kaplan had a loose leaf prayer book at the SAJ, at the Society for the Advancement of Judaism, his congregation. A loose leaf prayer book, which is quintessential Kaplan. You take things out, you put them in. You keep a core, to be sure, a core. I don't want to be attacked here. Uh, <laughs> okay. You keep a core, <laughs> but you have the freedom. After Ira Eisenstein, Kaplan's son-in-law and his most devoted disciple, passed away, his papers were at the Reconstructionist College. I went to see them and to investigate them. And I'm sitting in a room by myself in this archive. And what do I see? I see one of these notebooks. And I open it up, and there is Heschel, opposite Emerson. I started to cry. It was a deeply emotional experience. It was a revelation, if I might appropriate that word. <laughs> the point that I want to make is that Kaplan was a deeply pious man. I think what we have here are different kinds of piety, different languages. Heschel says the pious man is alive to the sublime and common acts. The most common act for everybody is lunch. <laughs> lunch. Most of us, most of us are usually out to lunch. <laughs> we are not mindful. We are you know, someplace else. In 1930, it's in my collection, it's outside. In 1930, November of 1930, Kaplan had just finished teaching Midrash to the rabbinical students here at the seminary. Kaplan didn't teach John Dewey. Kaplan didn't teach in these years for 20, 30 years. He taught Midrash because he felt that that's the way to help rabbis give sermons because he also taught homiletics. So he comes home, and he sits down to lunch, and he records his experience. This is a fair quid pro quo. I have given the world three hours of homiletics, and the world gave me back a nourishing lunch. <laughs> Not all the plagues of Egypt with the dividing of the Red Sea thrown into the bargain can compare in marvelousness with the miracle of exchange that makes it possible for me to get asparagus on toast in exchange for a homiletic interpretation of a few paragraphs of Leviticus Rabbah. <laughs> That's Kaplanian spirituality. That's Kaplanian spirituality. It is for this marvel of marvels that I thank God whenever I say grace, and I say it quite often, with cap or without cap. It's Kaplan the rebel, you know. I, I don't know whether he thought that anybody would read his diary and, and sense that little rebellion in there. Anyway, the point is that, that 
Heschel was unhappy in Cincinnati. He came to New York to visit Kaplan, and they talked about prayer, because Kaplan was working on his 1945 prayer book, and uh, Heschel went back, and one time he wrote a letter to Kaplan, and I, being a archival historian, discovered that letter in, in Kaplan's uh, letter file in Philadelphia. And it contains a knock your socks off um, a sentence, uh, one of those wonderful, fantastic Heschelian sentences, because Kaplan believed that you need to change the language so that people can understand what they're saying when they pray. You have to mean what you say when you pray. And, but Heschel writes back and he says, it's not a matter of nusach, it's not a matter of the language of prayer. What we need is a community of kavanah, a community of kavanah. In other words, what we need is a collective intention, a community a direction, a shared spiritual direction. In 1945, um, Heschel left Hebrew Union College and came to the seminary. And it was because, I'm not saying that Kaplan was completely responsible, but he was majorly responsible. Majorly responsible. He wanted Heschel at the seminary. Uh, this is a momentous time in Europe. Uh, the war had just ended. Roosevelt had just died. And um, uh, in June of that year, Mordechai Kaplan was excommunicated by the ultra-Orthodox community in the Hotel McAlpin, opposite Macy's, here in New York. Now, of course, Kaplan was not an ultra-Orthodox Jew, and so the implications were not great, but the point is that it's, it's significant. <laughs> it, it's significant. And what I want to say is that Heschel, the pious man, the poem that I read you, was in Kaplan's book. And the um, document of excommunication which Dan Cederbaum found a number of years ago, um, said that anybody that, that handles that book, in other words, Kaplan was excommunicated, but there's also anybody that uses the book. How much more so the people whose, whose poems, he, you know, he, he, he mentions in the back uh, that this is um, uh, ascribed to Heschel. Kaplan arranged his courses uh, so that Heschel would take them over. Perhaps a a, a presaging of what was to come. He sat in on, on uh, Heschel's course in 1945, and uh, November of 1945, and he says the following. He, meaning Heschel, is all I want him to be, both as a teacher and as an inspirational influence um, for, an, affirmative, for a, an affirmative Judaism. He is all I want him to be. I mean, Captain appreciated Heschel deeply, but he is not the type to confront problems and difficulties. As a romantic mystic, he shies away from facts and tries to build his universal discourse entirely with values. I mean, the point is that Kaplan expected an ordinary kind of uh, lecture from Heschel, and that's not, that's not what Heschel was about. That's not, he was Heschel, and uh, uh, that was the greatness, and Kaplan didn't quite understand that um, at this point. They socialized a lot, and one evening in 1949, uh, Kaplan records, this is all from the diary, Kaplan records that um, Gershon Sholem, who was in this country, had promised to come, but he didn't show up. <laughs> um, <laughs> what can I tell you? Um, another time in 1951, he says, I felt very much relaxed after one of these meetings and um, uh, managed to get rid of some of the gremlins in my attitude towards Heschel. You know, there's a degree of competition here that I don't want to um, uh, deny. He and I seem to be reaching out toward each other uh, across a bridgeable chasm, across a bridgeable chasm. And that's what I hope um, Susanna is going to uh, help us to understand. And I'm gonna come back a little bit later and talk a little bit more about Kaplan. Mel for organizing this evening and Arnie for hosting us and it's wonderful to be with friends and with some family also here this evening. Some of you I know were students of my father's or of Dr. Kaplan's 
uh, or just friends of theirs or touched by their work. Uh, you know, in those days when I was growing up, and in a sense I grew up here at the seminary, this was my parents' circle of friends, rabbis and students were divided. There were the Kaplan rabbis and the Heschel rabbis, and most of the time when I was quite young, really most of them, really most of them were Kaplan adherents, Kaplan disciples. And my father was um, fairly neglected during most of his career teaching here. So the question that Mel and I want to address this evening is, are there some ways in which we can find affinities? And Mel has spoken about that, and I also want to talk about that. I appreciate what Mel has said about Patrick Kaplan's recognition of my father, of his work, of his efforts to bring him here to the seminary. I can tell you that indeed my parents and the Kaplans socialized before I was born, after I was born. In fact, once when I was a teenager, my father brought me to the Kaplan home so that I could have a conversation with Dr. Kaplan. There was always a good feeling between them, a lot of warmth, as well as a European formality. They spoke to each other as Professor Kaplan, Professor Heschel. Uh, and I, I treasure that, actually. A student I'd never met, an undergraduate at another university, called me up one day and addressed me as Susanna, and I was horrified. <laughs> but I would also want to say, I think we can all agree that Dr. Kaplan paved the way for my father in many respects. He defied the efforts at assimilation of American Jews. He did a lot for us with Zionism, stressing Jewish ethnicity, the importance of a synagogue, of Jewish observance, of wanting to immerse oneself in everything Jewish. He kept Judaism alive for us and dynamic, showed that it's changing with us. And in that sense, I, would, I think we all agree, Professor Kaplan was a model of courage in the face of both assimilation and obscurantism. And I admire him for that. He understood American Jews and he gave voice to them. And when I read Dr. Kaplan's writings, I can hear American Jews talking. He understood. Now what do they have in common? What are their affinities? They came from Europe, from Orthodox backgrounds. They both received their smicha in Europe. <laughs> they were innovative. They were not afraid. They tackled big questions. They both made bat mitzvahs for their daughters. <laughs> and in fact, I have to just read you the lovely letter that Professor Kaplan sent to my father when my parents invited him to my bat mitzvah, which was not held here at the seminary, as you know, but at Anshe Chesed, because women could not be called to the Torah here in those days. So Professor Kaplan wrote, on behalf of Mrs. Kaplan and myself, I congratulate you on the occasion of your daughter, Hannah Susanna's bat mitzvah. May she grow up to be a good Jewess. <laughs> and be a source of happiness and blessing to both of you and to all whom she will meet in life's way. As you probably know, Dr. Heschel, I inaugurated the Bad Mitzvah celebration with my oldest daughter, Judith, in April 1922. She was the first of the four reasons for my doing that, the other three also being girls. <laughs> I am indeed happy that you approve of what I did, even though it apparently involved going out of your way. With all good wishes, cordially, Mordechai Kaplan. <laughs> I would also say from reading Professor Kaplan's diaries, both Dr. Kaplan and my father were very sensitive people. My father knew that Dr. Kaplan was miserable here at the seminary, and Dr. Kaplan knew that my father was treated very badly here at the seminary. Both would have wanted to leave, but there was no other place in those days. Like Dr. Kaplan, my father transcended the institution of the seminary, transcended the conservative rabbinate. He felt that the world needed something from him and that he was answerable to a higher authority, and I believe Dr. Kaplan felt the same way. He was speaking for all Jews. Dr. Kaplan was very much in step with his era. He understood that American Jews needed his ideas, and they were translated quickly into wonderful institutions. I regret my father did not have that kind of son-in-law to build. <laughs> but I admire Ira Eisenstein so much. 
My father was out of step in his time. He was criticized. He was misunderstood. He was even reviled for everything. His scholarship wasn't considered real scholarship. His theology was called pretty words. People used to come over to me. Can you imagine this when I was a child? and say, you know, your father's work is just poetry. Who would say that to the child, who insults a father to a child? But what does that mean, just poetry? Is it T.S. Eliot, Yeats, Shakespeare? It's just... <laughs> so that gives us some idea of how people were thinking in those days. And of course, my father's political stances went against the grain of his community, of the American Jewish community, of his colleagues at the seminary and many of his students. And conservative synagogues in my father's lifetime were not expressions of his view of Judaism and what it should be, of his view of prayer. I think that's changed since his death. But my father continued with his work, despite moments of terrible sorrow and of loneliness, just like Dr. Kaplan. And my father ultimately became, as Rabbi Belkin from Yeshiva University once said to him, Rabbi to the world. And actually, President Obama said to me two years ago, your father is our hero. My father respected and appreciated in Dr. Kaplan that he kept Jews Jewish, that he promoted Zionism, even as you remember from that address. And I was present at the Waldorf when there was a celebration of Dr. Kaplan's 90th birthday. My father pointed out that Dr. Kaplan also wore tchelis in his, in his oh, tzitzis, yeah. in his talis, yes, and my father did too. Both of them worried about assimilation and the superficiality of American Jews. Both tried to bring Jews back together to prevent the de-Judaization that was at work. My father wrote an article in the 1930s in Germany where he spoke about German Jews as reverse Muranos. Yeah. Jewish on the outside, Christian on the inside. And both men were active politically. My father, yes, was marching at Selma. I have to just tell you, Arnie, that I know people are very proud of that photograph and proud of the fact that my father and so many other Jews were involved in the civil rights movement. I sometimes wish, though, that that photograph is more of a challenge because what was accomplished in those days, as we know, is now in limbo in the Supreme Court and in so many other political institutions in this country. I wonder if we have the right to look at that photograph and feel proud. In those days, in 65, of course, Dr. Kaplan was then in his 80s, but he also had been involved in politics, in the work for the women's vote in 1920, for the inclusion of African Americans in labor unions on behalf of Sacco and Vanzetti. Both of them also saw that honesty and spirituality are intimately linked. My father wrote a book on the Kotzke Rebbe in the 1960s, and it was very much a 1960s project, because what was the Kotzke about, if you've read his work? His message was against mendacity and against inauthenticity. And that, of course, was the message of the 1960s. Both my father and Dr. Kaplan protested vehemently against dishonesty. Dishonesty to oneself is undermining what it is to be a Jew. Both of them promoted Zionism. Both wanted a revival of the Jewish spirit. Now, in 1958, my father spoke to a convention of rabbis. He used to go to conventions of rabbis and always come back a little bit upset because they never liked what he said. He always told them what they didn't want to hear, what was wrong, what was the problem, and so on. He felt that was his function. He wrote in 1958 that being in Galut, in exile, means not only being outside the land of Israel, it's also a spiritual condition, he said, and I'm sure you'll agree with me. He said, some bar mitzvah affairs are galut. <laughs> Our timidity and hesitance to take a stance on behalf of the Negroes are galut. It is not only that we are in galut, galut is in us. And I can well imagine Dr. Kaplan fully agreeing with those words. What is a covenant, my father said? It is an unconditional attachment to God. It is adherence to faith in the God of Abraham in the midst of darkness. Even though we're tortured by doubts, perplexities, confusions, and frustrations, this is the uniqueness of the Jewish people, the only people whose existence and religion are one. And again, I can imagine Dr. Kaplan feeling very much at home in these words. 
Both of them were gadflies. But I would say Dr. Kaplan wanted to change aspects of Judaism to better fit American Jews, and my father wanted to change American Jews so that they would appreciate Judaism. My father also would never change a word of the prayer book. There is the importance, the centrality of halakha, Jewish law, the Jewish sancta for Kaplan. I would say that his is more of a functionalist approach to Jewish observance of halakha, a functionalist approach, and I have to just say my late colleague Hans Penner wrote such a, an important critique of functionalism. My father rejected functionalism as expediency. You don't keep Shabbat because it strengthens Jewish identity or because it creates family coherence or because Shabbat has kept the Jewish people together for centuries. Rather, he said, the world is sublime and it cannot be an expedient tool for some other purpose. We need a radical reorientation to the sublime dimension of life, a sense of the inexpedient. Perhaps there are some bridgeable chasms between them. Reconciliation may not be necessary, but it's important to show that they're not in complete opposition and to remember also that they address different generations. Professor Kaplan's emphasis tends to be on the collective, the community. Judaism is a civilization, is a religious community. Our obligations to that collective, whereas my father emphasizes the individual. Jewish identity does not come from the collective alone. And in fact, enthusiastic membership in a community can sometimes be dangerous, politically, ethically, and spiritually. And I would just like to quote now from the wonderful Russian poet Joseph Brodsky, who gave a commencement address at Williams College in 1984, and he said, the surest defense against evil is extreme individualism, personality of thinking, whimsicality, even, if you will, eccentricity. Let's not get too caught up in what the rest of the community is doing. What about their views of Torah and halakha? In a 1937 book, The Meaning of God in Modern Jewish Religion, Professor Kaplan questions the relevance of laws and Torah, whose interpretation hasn't changed in so many centuries, and he says the following. The very notion that any text written hundreds of years ago at a time when the social situation was radically different from what it is today, that this can give us clear and valuable guidance in deciding ethically issues that did not arise until recent times is utterly antagonistic to the modern evolutionary outlook, Dr. Kaplan said. And he says in many places that the challenge is to take Torah seriously without taking it literally. My father would agree. He said, my father said, small-mindedness brings the exile of Torah. Literal-mindedness is an obstacle to faith. Literal readings of scripture, rigid adherence to religious practice leads to religious behaviorism. My father points out that if you want to be Jewish the way your grandparents are Jewish, it's inauthentic to who you are. It's spiritual plagiarism, he said. Spiritual plagiarism. My father says quite sharply, as sharp as Dr. Kaplan, he says, the sages of Israel have overlooked the human being and the Jew. They gain no insight into his difficulties and fail to understand his dilemmas. Every generation has its own problems. Every person is burdened with anxieties. But our sages remained silent. They did not guide the perplexed, and they showed no regard for the new problems that arose. Is it permissible or forbidden? Is it kosher or not? The authors of the halakha and the modern man do not speak the same language. Is it a sin to derive joy from Judaism? Finally, what about their understandings of God? For Kaplan, God was not an omnipotent supernatural being, but the power that makes for salvation, an internal force that allows individuals to seek goodness and moral perfection for themselves and for the whole world. My father differs. He says, if you want to know God, 
sharpen your sense of the human. For my father, the issue is not to redefine God, but to regain our ability to sense God's presence. Listen to this, quote, mankind in the modern era lost the organs for the supernatural world and its secrets only because it lost, together with the faith, also the disposition toward the supernatural world. And you know who wrote that? Feuerbach in the 19th century. Indeed, for my father, the grand premise of religion is the ability to surpass the self. And here he turns to the sublime, as Amel also has cited, not as an object that evokes terror or fear, but rather wonder and amazement. When we sense the sublime, he says, we are on our way to an awareness of the divine. For the sublime is the silent illusion of things to a meaning greater than themselves. What we encounter in our perception of the sublime, in our radical amazement, is a spiritual suggestiveness of reality, an elusiveness to transcendent meaning. The world in its grandeur is full of a spiritual radiance. For my father, the sublime is not sensuous. It's not to be perceived by the senses. And the response is not abjection. The human, he says, does not belong to the category of the animal, but rather is independent of it. The question is rather, what's human about the human being? What's distinctive? What are we capable of achieving? And how is God a challenge to us? As always, my father's writings are themselves elusive and also terribly intimate. We draw meaning based on who we are. There are no definitions, no formulas that he gives. And so often people tell me they read my father's writings and they feel he's speaking to them personally. They sense that intimacy. And that's because my father was an intimate person, capable of profound empathy. He was the kind of person who was able to write about God in this way. By perceiving and appreciating the sublime dimension of reality, that is when self-transcendence begins. But the larger question my father always posed is, what do we do with our faith? Do we bring it to the synagogue? Do our communal organizations, AJCs and ADLs and APACs and so forth? No, he said, quote, the leaders of our people do not know the language of the soul. There is a gulf between the soul of the individual and the atmosphere of the synagogue. That neglect has a long history. I think it is being overcome since my father's death. But my father said some radical words. He said, we speak of the obligations of the individual to tradition, but what of the rights of the individual within Jewish tradition? We have forgotten the love of God for Israel. And let us remember that it is because of God that my father marched in Selma. Jewish survival, he said, is a spiritual and not only a political problem. And this was his starting point, how to revive the spirit, how to rekindle the joy. And this is what worried Dr. Kaplan as well. We have to reorient ourselves as individuals, and we have to define what it is to be a Jew, what we stand for as Jews, what Judaism offers us, if only we can know. There is no faith, my father says, except in the cultivation of the heart, in the depths of the soul, in the ennoblement of the mind. Let me just conclude with a teaching from my father's grandfather, the person that he was so very much felt very close to, the Aptarov. He passed away in 1825, but it was the person, the ancestor my father felt deeply attached to. There's a small small teaching of the Aptarov in which he says, you know, we image God in human terms, anthropomorphisms, yes? We speak of the arm of God, the finger of God. But then he says, how does God see us? How do we look 
from God's point of view? What would it mean for God to image us in divine terms? We can't even begin to conceive what that would be. That teaching, which was so classic to the Abdurav and to Hasidism, that's what inspired my father, and that's what he brought from Europe to this country. I thank you. like to stand up. Uh, you've been sitting for a while. Stretch. Everybody, please stand up. Okay, thank you very much. I feel maybe we should, maybe we should sing a song. <laughs> because we're talking about bridgeable chasms in all the world. There's a narrow ridge. But the important point is not to be afraid. Kol haolam kulo, hu Thank you. I was very moved by uh, Susanna's presentation. Um, Hesha was my teacher when I was at the seminary. I was before the beard, uh, his beard and my beard, uh, before the white hair and before civil rights. Um, and he awakened in us a sense of wonder. It was amazing. He had just published Man Is Not Alone, and we read that together. Now, I could be amazed. I could be radically amazed. I could be in a state of wonder. I could relate to the mystery. In other words, trying to understand why there was something rather than nothing. But when he told me that there was meaning beyond the mystery, I could not follow him. When he told me that mystery was an ontological category, I wasn't sure what he meant. I'm still not sure what that means. <laughs> the point is that the presence of God was so powerful for Heschel that the transition from the mystery to the presence of God was necessary and inevitable. But there were those of us in the classroom and outside the classroom who could not follow him. Maybe that's why I got a B in the course. <laughs> I was dismayed. And many years later, in the early 70s, Kaplan rescued me. He rescued me because he told me that Judaism was a matter of my biography. Belonging was more important than believing, as Reconstructionists like to say. Kaplan freed me. He freed me to follow my own unique religious instincts and my own unique religious understanding. He gave me choices where there were very few. He made Judaism function for me. I want to speak briefly about three aspects. I want to speak about Kaplan's emphasis on individualism. I want to speak a little bit about his notion of halakha and about Kaplan and God. Heschel tells us that he wants to move human beings from self-consciousness to God-consciousness. Kaplan, I would like to say, wants to move us from God-consciousness 
God-centeredness to individual-centeredness. The exalted self for Kaplan is the ideal. But both Kaplan and Heschel looked toward the transformation of the individual. That, those are Heschel's words about the purpose of religion. They had different vocabularies, as Richard Rorty would say. Kaplan talked about the power that makes for salvation. I'd like to analyze it and offer you an alternative. The power that makes for salvation, in Kaplan's words, in my opinion, salvation is whatever we conceive as a maximum fulfillment of the highest possibilities of human nature. It is life at its maximum and at its optimum. It was life abundant, he said. It was the desire to be fully human. It was self-fulfillment and self-realization. And he would exclude, he would not discuss, obviously, our narcissism and our egocentricity. That was not on the table, that was below um, uh, the horizon. We are addicted to that, all of us, but the point is that Kaplan would rise above it and would have us rise above it. In Emerson's words, we are striving for the unattained but attainable self. The unattained but attainable self. As Stanley Cavell writes when he's talking about Emerson, that the self is a nextness. The self is a process. And so what Kaplan does is he, he puts individualization into the center of Judaism. Individualism represents a democratization of Judaism. Not that everyone creates his own Judaism, but that we join a group of like-minded Jews who advocate a Judaism which allows our best selves to flourish. Kaplan is, of course, the ultimate pluralist. Justice calls for the kind of world, he said, in which all persons and peoples are permitted to attain the maximum growth to which their capacities entitle them. I'm sure Heschel would agree with that. Salvin, salvation for Kaplan is universal. Such is the mutuality of human life that none can be saved until all are saved. I want to revise the phrase, the power that makes for salvation. I think it's a difficult phrase. Salvation is not common, a common expression in the Jewish community. Power that reifies. It creates a new thing. It's not a supernatural deity, but it is something outside of ourselves. Kaplan coined the wonderful word for me, which is to thingify. What we do is we turn processes into things. The self is a series of processes, imagination, understanding, and we posit a self, which is an entity, and we do the same thing with God. Not the power that makes for salvation, I would suggest to you, but the process because when you talk about process, you cannot reify it. You cannot imagine a thing, but you're talking about a series of events. And what Kaplan wanted to emphasize was the process that makes for integration. He says that in the clip, if you remember. Kaplan, again from the diary, selfhood, soul, or personality are the terms by which we designate the principle of integration. That is the manifestation of the divine in man. Man's salvation thus consists in his maximum possible integration. In other words, wholeness is holiness for Kaplan. And that's what we strive for. Similarly, when we generally pray, we open the door in ourselves to the cosmically integrated power or God. That's where Kaplan and Heschel meet. There are moments Moments where Kaplan visits the realm where Heschel lives. And there are moments when Heschel visits the realm where Kaplan lives. Divinity for Kaplan is in integration, creativity, and growth. He means it on the personal level. I would like my public self and my private self to be integrated. I think we all want that. You know the t-shirt. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a husband, I'm a father, a professor, a writer, a Jew. I want all of those to be one, to be whole, to be integrated. Maybe that's for me what the Shema is about. If God is one, why can't I be one? And you know the t-shirt. 
I wish myself would talk to each other. <laughs> and of course, integration in the general social realm is very, very obvious. It's blacks and whites, it's gays and straights, it's the blue and the red. We need to be whole, though we differ. Integration is the goal. Integration for Kaplan is a theological category. The Haredim and the Chilonim in Israel, the secular and the ultra-religious need to learn this. They need to learn that the Arabs have to be full citizens of Israel. <laughs> Philosophy is a map. You might say this is very idealistic, but we need to know the destination if we're going to get there. These are the fundamental Kaplan, Kaplanian ideals. But ideals need to be embodied. If ideals are not embodied, they are merely philosophy. Of course, philosophy is what we're all about, <laughs> so I shouldn't use the word merely. But for Kaplan, religion is the embodiment of those ideals. Hence his love for the Jewish people. The Jewish people, remember in, in the clip, he said the Jewish people should help us to become fully human. In other words, it is only in community and for us, the Jewish people, that our humanness can be established. And I think this is what you were saying also. Kaplan loved the Jewish people. He loved the Jewish people. Of course, there were members of his congregation that he, <laughs> he couldn't stand. But our rabbi, I don't want to uh, have blame him because I think he was giving us the words of somebody else. Mark, was there somebody else? Where's Mark? Yeah, it was somebody else? I think so. Maybe it was your words. Anyway, the important thing is that the synagogue is the place we learn to live with people you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> Kaplan was pragmatic. It was not a dirty word for Kaplan. It meant that we have to be conscious of what is for our benefit. We have to evaluate what is for the benefit of the individual and for the benefit of the community. And Dewey said very famously that the community is about the welfare of each of the individuals in the community. I think it's very important that Kaplan and Heschel stand shoulder to shoulder in their love for the Jewish people. That's obvious. But Kaplan is not halachic. He does not accept the notion of revelation in the usual sense. Revelation is the product of our search for meaning, which is explicitly rejected. That notion that the Torah is the product of the Jewish search for meaning is explicitly rejected by Heschel. Kaplan says the following, what we need about observance, what we need is a regimen of observance that shall be affirmative and inspiring. Wow, I mean, everybody that takes Judaism seriously could agree with that. But if this requirement is to be met, it can only be on the acceptance of diversity in regimens as normal and legitimate. Kaplan saw the essence of Judaism as the living energy of the Jewish people. And he said rather early on that any way in which a Jew nurtures that living energy is just as good as any other. Of course, he was a synagogue person. He was a rabbi, and he hoped people would come to synagogue. But there are people that don't come to synagogue, hence the Jewish center. He was very, very concerned about the social body of the Jewish people. Kaplan saw um, halacha as minhag, as custom. Custom or minhag is not a weak word. It's a strong word. It's not customs and ceremonies which is sometimes the way it's derisively referred to. Minhag 
is the product of the collective will and of generations of habit. Kaplan maintained that if you bring your children up in Jewish habits, they will be Jewish. They will have a minhag, which is their own, and a minhag, which they follow all the rest of their lives. For Kaplan, the mitzvah system was maximal. He used that term, and it's important, and yet open to all of the ideals. I want to give you an example of Kaplan's minhag, of his piety. You know, we have so often when you hear people speak in the Jewish ambiance, they give you um, stories from the Hasidic masters, which are wonderful. I, I want to give you uh, stories from, from uh, what Schechter called Kaplan, a Bregesim is nugget, a very angry oppositional. Yeah, Kaplan was not angry, he's happy too. The point is that I know that Kaplan David, he prayed every morning in the 20s and 30s. I know that. I know he put on his talis and tefillin, and after he daven, he learned a blat gemara, a folio of the Talmud. I know that. And so at a certain point, I said to Ira Eisenstein, when did he stop? And so Ira said, well, I didn't live with him, so how am I supposed to know when he stopped? But then he thought for a moment, and he said, well, in the summer of 42, the summer of 42, we were down at the Jersey Shore. I love this story because I come from New Jersey. <laughs> we were down at the Jersey Shore, and Ira said, I saw a Kaplan. He would get up every morning, and he would put on his talis, his prayer shawl, and put on his, to fill in his phylacteries, and he, he would daven from the Siddur, from the prayer book. And sometimes, sometimes, he would get up and put on his talis and put on his tefillin, and he would read John Dewey. <laughs> I call that davening from Dewey. <laughs> and I want you to remember that. Not that you have to daven from Dewey, but that we must find that which inspires us. And that's why I love the synagogue, that I'm a member of Western Synagogue, and our rabbi, so much because on Passover we read from Maya Angelou. We read from Maya Angelou, and that's really, really where it ought to be. In addition to doing the Hallel, in addition to doing the Hallel, and that is the quintessential Kaplan. That's his idiosyncratic, naturalistic piety. I want to give you another quote from the diary. By the way, yeah. Okay, two minutes. Wow, two minutes, oh wow. What, what am I gonna do with God? I, I'm, <laughs> what am I gonna do with God? Oh wow, okay, okay, I'll try. I want to note, he says, he's on a train. And he says, I want to note, with the help of God, the life, the love, and the intelligence of the universe, I have been able to turn to good account the hours I am spending on this train. That's Kaplan's spirituality. It's Kaplan's piety. The life, the love, and the intelligence of the universe. I want to, that I've been able to turn to good account the hours I am spending on this train. Okay, uh, Susanna it began to give us some insight into Kaplan's theology. Um, it is very, very um, um, complex um, because Kaplan is not merely a naturalist. Kaplan is a theist. The ideals are divine. He talks that way. He talked that way in the clip. The ideals of compassion and the ideals of mercy and being merciful, they are a matter of process and they are divine. But there's something more. The eternal, he says, is an infinite becoming and not an actual being. That is why we should conceive God as process and not as entity. Process, not as entity. Divine means the infinite possibilities of growth. Divine is in the 
is in the potential. Prayer is, of course, a problem. Reconstructionists, um, people ridicule reconstructionists and say they pray to whom it may concern. <laughs> I want to read Kaplan on prayer. Prayer is the calling into existence of the image of God that lies within each of us. It is the public statement of our covenant with ourselves and the willingness to commit ourselves to those ideals that we believe should govern our lives. Okay, I want to end because Arnie is my friend and <laughs> I don't want to alienate him. Um, I want to end with a Kaplan prayer. This is from the diary. The diary, by the way, the original of the diary is upstairs in the uh, uh, seminary archives. It's 27 volumes and it has been put on uh, the internet. So any one of you can consult the diary. Uh, you go to the uh, seminary website, uh, library and uh, digital and so on and so forth. He says the following, let every prayer we recite, every song we sing, every teaching we listen to, set the current of Israel's life coursing through our whole being. Challenge us to test the ever living truth of what Israel has learned concerning man's task on earth and reveal to us the God who always stands at the door of our heart, waiting, as it were, to be admitted. In this spirit, let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to thee, O God, my strength and my redeemer. <laughs>